So, uh, welcome back. Uh, it's good to see you tonight. Uh, we, we begin our discussion on the Eucharist. It's, it's really a three-week discussion, uh, and what we're going to do, hopefully, is explore the uh, history and reality of the Eucharist. Um, the Eucharist is central to, to Christian experience. Um, I, I don't say Catholic experience because I, I, I don't want you to think that this is something just for Catholics, you know, in a denominational sense. It's not that at all. I could say, really, uh, I could say that the Eucharist is central to human experience, uh, not, just, not just Catholic, not just Christian, but, but human experience. You'll, you'll hear it say, said over and over again, uh, the Eucharist is, is quote unquote, the source and the summit uh, uh, of our life, and it is, you know, but, but Catholics should be on guard against thinking that Eucharist belongs only to us. Uh, because, it, because it doesn't. Um, if, if what we say about the Eucharist is true as, as Catholics, uh, then the Eucharist is the center to everything. Uh, it's the center uh, of, of, of the cosmos, <laughs> the center of my life, the center of your life, uh, and the life of every human person uh, everywhere. Uh, and, and not just the center of the Catholic Church, um, as an institution or, or a denomination uh, or even as a culture. Uh, uh, the Eucharist is, as I said, uh, central to human experience. Uh, so to review a bit, uh, you, you know the, the song by now, we, we've talked about the church as a communion, uh, as an organism, uh, and, and uh, has uh, the mystery of Christ coming to us uh, in the Word of God, right? This organism, when, when it speaks, it speaks scripturally in the Word of God, uh, and, and also it encounters us, it touches us in sacrament, right? And, and, and sacrament, uh, as, as we talked about it last time, uh, sacraments are those signs uh, that participate in what they signify. Uh, that, that's the definition of a sacrament that, that works for me. A sign, it's a sign which participates in what it signifies. And, and so, you know, baptism, for example, uh, signifies death and resurrection uh, in Jesus, but, 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 it, but it more than just signifies it, right? It, 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 um, it, it participates in it, right? It, it really is a sharing in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, confirmation, again, which we talked about very briefly because I ran out of time. Um, it, 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 it signifies the uh, descent of the Holy Spirit, uh, but, it, but it also affects, in truth, the, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the, the person, right? It, 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 it is a, 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 um, a, a real sort of encounter with the reality of Pentecost itself, at least as we understand it, right? Uh, and and this, this logic of uh, of the sacraments, uh, that, that they are signs which participate in what they signify. They just don't, they not just point to it, but they actually share in it. Uh, that's true of all the sacraments, uh, and especially, especially the Eucharist, as, as hopefully we'll come to see very clearly over these next three weeks. And so to think about the Eucharist, the Eucharist goes by a lot of names. Uh, it, it goes, we talk about going to Mass, you know, uh, the breaking of the bread is another way to talk about it, especially in the New Testament. Um, the agape, the love feast, is, is, a, is a word for it as well, you find in early Christianity. Um, sometimes it's called the synaxis. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox sometimes call it the synaxis, uh, the action together. Um, the most common name, of course, is Eucharist. Uh, which comes from the Greek word uh, found throughout the New Testament, which simply means thanksgiving, right? That, that's what Eucharist uh, means very basically. And so as always, when we talk about sacraments, we're, we're going to begin with Scripture. And so all these handouts, that are the handout that you have, all, everything in front of you, this week is Scripture. Tomorrow, next week, we'll uh, look into the tradition. Uh, a few weeks ago, when we talked about baptism, we quoted at the very beginning, remember, the end of Peter's uh, first sermon 
uh, on the day of Pentecost itself when he exhorted everybody to, to repent and be baptized. You know, that's how he, how he finished his, his preaching, the, the call to repent and be baptized. Um, let's begin our discussion on the Eucharist in the exact same place, um, the day of Pentecost as recorded in, in Acts of the Apostles, um, there in chapter 2. Uh, Luke, on occasion, when you read Acts of the Apostles, he'll sort of stop and give you a, a summary of what's going on. He'll sort of uh, sum up the, the growth of the church and, and gives you a little sort of uh, thumbnail sketch of, of uh, early Christianity. And so you see this in Acts 2.42, very famous verse. It says, and they, they the Christians, uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching in the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and uh, the prayers. And so, very simply, this is what Luke says uh, the early Christians were on about. They devoted themselves to the, the apostles' teaching, which very simply is that Jesus is Lord, right? That Jesus is the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18, 15. Uh, he is the Christ, right? The, the Son of God, the fulfillment of the Davidic promise. Um, you know, that is, in, in short, the gospel. You know, the Father and the Son are one. And... and, and uh, they devoted themselves to the fellowship which resulted from that truth, which everybody believed in. Um, and, and that's the communion that, that I've talked so much about, it, the, the oneness for which Jesus uh, prayed. Um, but then they also devoted themselves, Paul, or Luke says, to, to quote unquote the breaking of the bread uh, and to the prayers. Um, and, and the breaking of the bread is just lingo in the New Testament uh, for what we today call the Eucharist, the prayers we'll talk about later, um, but just very quickly to point out that, that these early Christians were also good Jews and they would have prayed daily and uh, multiple times throughout the day, just like good Jews would have, right? We'll talk about that when we talk about prayer. Um, now, the early church didn't invent the Eucharist uh, at all. Uh, rather, they got it, as, as Paul said, from the Lord. We'll, we'll talk about that very interesting phrase uh, that Paul uses in, in a little bit. Uh, but of course, the Lord really didn't invent it either in a, in a way he did, but in another way, uh, he, he didn't. You know, he gave the gift of the Eucharist, uh, as we'll see, from, from within a very Jewish context. Um, uh, he, he, very quickly, before we move on, you know, just one example of uh, breaking of the bread. Uh, there, Paul in Acts 20, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together for... Uh, to break bread, uh, Paul talked with him, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. The poor guy preached till midnight, uh, which I appreciate, uh, and I, I'd like to try it one day. Um, but anyway, just you know, again, just to point out the, the lingo ness of that phrase, breaking the bread. Uh, but to get back on track, as I said, uh, uh, Christians uh, got the breaking of the bread from the Lord, but, but the Lord gave this practice of uh, uh, breaking the bread uh, from within uh, the Hebrew mindset, Hebrew uh, sacred imagination and, and story and idiom. Uh, and, and it all begins on, on Mount Sinai. Uh, by the way, if you've read my little booklet, which just came out a couple of months ago on the Eucharist, I talk about this a lot. Um, it's to Mount Sinai, right? It's Mount Sinai, which you'll remember from vacation Bible school days, uh, that, that Moses led the Hebrew people to this mountain uh, after their liberation from Egypt. It's called Jebel Musa uh, today. Um, and, and here on this mountain, God called Moses up uh, to, uh, uh, to, to talk to him, to give him the law, while, while everyone else had to stay away, right? If you read... Exodus. Um, uh, Moses could come up, but everybody had to stay away. Um, and, and, you know, not even an animal could touch the mountain, otherwise it had to be killed uh, because it was such a holy thing that only Moses, the prophet, could, could come up to it. Um, and as I said, it's on this mountain that God gave the covenant uh, to Israel. And it's there uh, at Sinai that he, for the very first people, uh, very first time called the Hebrews um, his people, his royal priesthood, right? It's, it's, where, it's, it's on Sinai that we first get that language of, of you shall be a royal priesthood, O Israel. Um, 
And, and so it's on mountain, it's on that mountain, Jebel Musa, Mount Sinai. Jebel Musa means mountain of Moses, by the way. Um, uh, it's on Mount Sinai that, 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 that uh, God claims this newly liberated people for his own uh, and, and then also gives them the law, right? So it's, it's at Sinai that the covenant is uh, struck and, and, and Israel is made, really. Uh, and so it's a foundational event uh, and, and it makes uh, Israel what Israel is. Now, it's interesting at the end uh, of this meeting of God with Moses, um, this giving of the law, if you, if you read on, uh, they're, 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 when it came a time to uh, receive and ratify the covenant, just like you know, all covenants, all contracts have to be sort of ratified, um, uh, there's a very interesting moment, very interesting moment, uh, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's really one of the ways I begin to think about the Eucharist biblically. And it's there in front of you, it's from Exodus 24, 7 through 11. It says, then he took, this is Moses, uh, th and then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has done, or, uh, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders went of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and they ate and drank. Um, so, so just think about that passage for a second, right? Uh, one, it, it mirrors the shape of the mass, for, st for starters. Uh, they hear the word of God and, and they agree to it, you know, just like you hear the word of God and the liturgy of the word and say amen, you know. Um, Moses takes the blood of an animal and, and he sprinkles it on the people and says, uh, behold, the blood of the covenant. Um, again, think in very primitive, uh, primitive terms, you know. Uh, Moses uses blood, this, this primeval very earthy material uh, to signify the bond that has been made between God and Israel, right? It's thinking very basic uh, primitive terms, you know, blood seals the deal between God and Israel, blood seals the, the covenant. Um, yeah, and again, you know, the, 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 none of this is rocket science. Uh, when, when, when people are connected by blood, it's a bond, right? Uh, my, my kids, my daughter, my son, uh, you know, th they're my own flesh and blood. A and so the bond is strong, right? It's stronger than other bonds, right? That's just the way it, it is. That's good and, and normal. You know, maybe when you're a kid, uh, thank God I don't think kids do this anymore because it's gross, but you know the oh, thing about, uh, uh, you know, you, you have a best friend or something and you cut your finger and you rub them together because you want to be quote unquote blood brothers, right? Which as I said, is disgusting. Um, but but it's the, the, the thought is the same, right? It, it's a primeval human uh, notion, you know? What are you trying to say in this very elementary way? You're trying to say that, that you want the, this bond, this bond of friendship or something, you, you, you want it to be strong because we have this idea, it's almost inscribed into us, this idea uh, that, that blood binds us closely uh, together. And, and so that's what you see and hear when, when, when Moses takes this blood and sprinkles it on the people in the name of God, right? That, that's what that means. Um, and so I want, to take, want you to sort of hold that idea uh, you know, keep it in your mind that, that the covenant is sealed in, in blood, you know, so hold that thought right over here um, uh, while we notice something else that's pretty remarkable about this uh, passage. Uh, see what it says at the very end. Um, Moses and the elders go up the mountain, and, and what does it say? It says, uh, they saw God, they ate, drank, they beheld God, 
and they ate and drank. The, the, the Hebrew word for behold, that's translated behold, uh, means seeing. Uh, it's the same word used uh, when describing prophetic vision in other parts of the Old, Old Testament, right? So, so these guys come, come up uh, halfway up the mountain, which today is called Elijah's Basin, and, um, and, and, and they, they, they see God as they're eating and drinking, right? Up to this point, no creature could even touch the mountain, right, as I said, without being struck dead, right? Now they come up halfway up the mountain, uh, and a number of them do, and they see God, right? This is a very rare experience, um, uh, you know, for Israelites to see God. Um, yeah, later in Exodus, Moses will ask to see God, uh, and, and God will say uh, to him that he has to hide in the cleft of the rock, and, and so that maybe he could see the quote-unquote back of God, you know, it's anthropomorphism. Um, it, it, for, for Jews, for Hebrews who, who believed that, that God was so transcendent, so, so other, so, so holy, uh, that to see God is to, would, would risk being struck dead, you know, um, annihilated. Um, it's, it's very rare uh, in, in the Old Testament uh, for, for anyone to see God, right? So this is a very amazing moment, this moment that the covenant is ratified. Uh, they, 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 the, the, the blood is sprinkled on them. You get this sense of being bound to God. And, and, and then um, they eat and they see, right? Blood, eating and drinking, seeing God. Hold those thoughts, right? Those very basic ideas. Um, and also, again, just to notice on, on, on the description uh, of seeing God, how poetic it gets. You know, it, it, I've always thought of it as like, it's like language in this experience of seeing God language is collapsing, right? Language, human speech is, is, is failing. So what do you do? You, you got to go poetic, right? Pavement of sapphire, the very heaven for clearness. You see a, a similar sort of um, abstract poeticism in the first chapter of Ezekiel, for example, um, be, because we, we don't know what we're seeing, right? It's, it's, it's a heaven, it's a vision of the, the divine, right? Uh, um, you know, and again, it says, it's, it says, he did not lay his hand on, on them, right? He's like telling you, like, this is rare. They didn't die, right? They saw God and it, they didn't get killed. Um, and, 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 and so, again, notice that this, this, this event, this amazing sort of mystical, or not sort of, it is a mystical event, um, happens within the context of the ratification of a covenant between God and Israel. Um, which involves blood, which involves eating, right? These are the very basic things of, of the foundation of Israel itself. Um, and so this is the sacred sort of imagination, uh, the very Hebrew imagination uh, behind Jesus. And, and, and it is what makes the Eucharist, when he talks about it in the Gospels, intelligible at all, right? Jesus is speaking from that tradition. Um, so, to fast forward uh, out of the Old Testament into the New, uh, first look at the Gospels. Um, the Eucharistic text par excellence, as you probably know, is John 6, which is a very long uh, chapter, uh, very beautiful, and, and it's worth the read. Um, and, and, and it's important to see the chapter as a whole. First, uh, it begins, the first 15, 16 verses begins by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, probably Bethsaida, and, and it's the story of the miracle of the loaves, right? The Gospels relate that, that there are two feeding miracles of the multitudes. John only has one. Uh, and, and what's going on in that story is, is uh, um, it, it, it clearly is portraying Jesus to be like Moses. Remember, a central uh, understanding of the early Christians was that, was that Jesus was the fulfillment of, as I said, Deuteronomy 18, 15, that prophecy where Moses says, one like me will come after me, follow him. And so throughout the gospels, Jesus is portrayed 
in very Moses-like terms. Um, instead of giving the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, he preaches the Beatitudes from uh, um, the Sermon on the Mount, right? And, and here, just like Moses uh, fed the Hebrews with manna in the desert uh, in Exodus 16, Numbers 11, uh, here Moses is, is doing this Moses-like thing um, by feeding another group of Hebrews wandering in the wilderness, right? Um, and, and, and so that's what John and the other gospel writers are doing again and again and again in a bunch of different ways uh, to, to make us understand that, that Jesus is like Moses. He's the prophet like unto Moses from Deuteronomy 18, 15, and, and therefore we should follow him. You know, it's very important in early Christian preaching. Um, and this stirs people up, as if you read John 6, it clearly does. It stirs people up. They are able to connect the dots, and, and they, they start to think that this guy's the Messiah, and, 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 and you can tell that they have a very sort of political uh, concept of the Messiah because they want to seize him and make him king. And what happens is, is that he um, escapes their grasp, right? He, they're, they're not able to sort of grab him by force and crown him Christ, you know? Um, he escapes their grasp. And the very next story is very interesting in John's Gospel. Right after that comes the story of Jesus walking on the water, right? So the disciples get in the boat and they go across the Sea of Galilee and Jesus does not get into the boat with them. Uh, he says, go on, I'll, I'll meet you. And, and, and that tees up the story uh, for Jesus uh, uh, walking on the water, which John is telling us by giving us this story that yes, he's the Christ, yes, he's the Messiah, he is the prophet like unto Moses, but he's not the prophet like unto Moses or the Messiah or the Christ like you think he is. He's also God, right? He's not just some sort of uh, revolutionary leader like Che Guevara or anything like that. He, he is God from God, light from light. He can walk on water, right? And, and the very interesting thing when, when you read, read it, you know, he, he, he gets into the boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and when they come ashore, uh, somehow miraculously, uh, the crowd's there. And some people notice that Jesus got out of the boat, but he didn't get in it, right? And so you have this very enigmatic question, um, Rabbi, uh, when did you come here, right? And, and as, as it's so beautiful in John's Gospel, uh, uh, words and sometimes questions and phrases uh, mean multiple things, <laughs> you know? Some people think of it in very earthly terms. What do you mean born again, right? But Jesus means something heavenly or something is meant heavenly. Rabbi, when did you get here? It could mean, when did you get in the boat? Or what's your origin, right? It's, it's that mysterious question. Or when uh, Pilate comes back into the room and, and he goes, where are you from, right? And of course the answer is Galilee, but Right? That's the beauty of John's gospel, but that's an aside. You know, the point is, this Messiah, this Christ, this Moses-like figure is, um, uh, you can't pin him down, right? And, and, and so that tees us up to uh, the part of uh, John's gospel, John chapter 6, uh, that happens in Capernaum, uh, which deals with the bread of life discourse. Um, it, it's in Capernaum. There, uh, as we move on in chapter six, that Jesus starts up a conversation uh, with the people gathered there, some of whom, we assume, uh, were at the miraculous feeding, and they've been following these events too. And, and, and Jesus asked them basically, he says, you know, you remember that uh, um, bread I gave you in the desert? You remember that? Um, what do you think of that? And, and, and then he, he goes on to, to ask them to think about the, the bread that Moses gave in the desert, uh, contrasted with the bread that he gave. Uh, and then he, then he asked them to think about something called the bread of life. Uh, and, and so um, we're going to look at these verses, 6, 48 through 58, and this is just a small snippet of a larger discourse which is worth your time. Um, but I just want you to focus on a few words. Uh, the, the word flesh, uh, also the phrase I am, uh, and also in the verb remain. And also notice that the, his, a lot of people who are listening to him are murmuring, which is the exact same word that's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, 
to describe the murmuring of the Hebrews in, in the desert, right? And so again, the, that's what John's trying to uh, point to. Um, anyway, so, so look at John 6, 48 through 58. He says, I am the bread of life. Um, again, just stop down right there. Uh, ego and me, I, I am. I am is the divine name, right? So whenever Jesus says ego and me, you should always think, hmm, uh, Exodus 3.14, divine name. And so we have the divine name, and then we have what? The bread of life, right? So this uh, juxtaposition of, of, of God and bread. Uh, Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread. I am, I go on me again. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, uh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Again, just like Nicodemus, um, what do you mean born again? Uh, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, uh, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread uh, will live forever. And again, very simply, uh, Jesus identifies himself uh, with the bread of life. I am the bread of life, he says. And, and, and then he immediately identifies the bread of life with his flesh. Right, the Greek word is sarx, which is the flabby bit under your arm, right? He, he really means flesh. He's not talking in sort of, uh, he, he doesn't use the word soma, for example. This is a very sort of philosophical word. He says sarks, flesh. He's, he's, um, it's, it's meant to shock, to, to, to a shock you know. Um, and, and, and again, very simply, he, he says you have to eat this flesh. You have to chew, uh, is, is the proper translation really. Uh, you have to chew this sarks, this flesh, uh, and drink his blood in order to have life and in order to, uh, quote, remain in him. Now, remain is a, is a you know, theologically technical term in John's gospel. Uh, it, it's, uh, menain is the verb in Greek which can be translated remain or abide, right? When Jesus says the night before his death, abide in me, right? Um, that's the same verb. When the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus at his baptism, uh, the Holy Spirit came down and remained on him. It's the exact same word, right? It, it, it's a verb which describes the binding of the persons of the Trinity to one another, the binding of disciples to Christ there in John 15, and the binding which happens by the eating of the flesh of Jesus. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so it's all, it's all sort of beautiful in that sense. Uh, but of course, this is intolerable language for many. Um, John 6 does not end very well. Uh, you, you, you get the impression that, that pretty much everybody left him except the 12. Uh, you see here at the very end. Uh, After this, many disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Uh, so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. A few things. One, I remember this Russian Orthodox priest who I was uh, new um, pointed this out. It's, it's, it's not real, but it's fun and kind of spooky. Um, that line, after this, uh, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walk, walked with him. Right? That's describing the people who did not believe this, uh, those who no longer w walked with them. And I had this Russian Orthodox priest who I know said, notice what verse that is. He goes, that's John 666. It's like, oh, spooky. Um, uh, and, uh, you can tell that to your friends, but uh, 
But it, more importantly, notice this, and this was the clincher for me when I was growing in the faith. Um, what really matters, mattered for me was that Jesus uh, didn't correct himself, right? He didn't correct himself. At no point uh, did Jesus say, you know, wait a second, you, you misunderstand me, you got me all wrong, let me, let me, let me clarify. Uh, he, he, he doesn't do that. In, instead, he, he turns to his disciples, and, and, and he, again, he didn't ask his disciples, hey, did I, did I mess that up? Uh, what, what could I have done better? He, he doesn't say that at all. He, he simply says, would you like to leave too? Um, would you like to go too? Uh, uh, Jesus um, did not uh, produce a teaching um, Jesus, Jesus didn't really care about offending people. Uh, uh, he kept pressing the point, uh, as, as you see in this chapter. Uh, now, as I said, this was a clincher for, or not, this was a very important pass, thing for me uh, as, as I started to take the Christian faith seriously and, and as I started to accept this thing called the real presence, uh, 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 the teaching that Jesus is truly present in, in the bread and the wine of the Eucharist and, and not just symbolically, right? Not just metaphorically. Uh, I knew that, that Catholic Christians, uh, as well as Eastern Orthodox and, and some Anglicans, I came from the Anglican background, uh, a, a lot of people believe that Jesus was truly present in, in the Eucharist and I knew that they pointed to John 6 uh, to back up that, that belief. Uh, and, and so when I read John 6, I, you know, it's clear he does radically identify uh, his flesh and blood with bread and wine. Um, and, and, and I noticed that, that the, 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 the crowd understood, uh, the crowd got it, that, that Jesus was not speaking symbolically. Uh, in fact, they were scandalized and kind of grossed out, probably some of them. And because of that, they left, right? So they, the, his original hearers knew that he wasn't talking metaphorically, right? Um, and, and then again, Jesus did not correct himself. He let the people go, right? He let people leave, which tells me, whether you believe it or not, is another matter, but it tells me that Jesus meant what he said, right? He, he, he meant what he said because he, he didn't correct himself. Because if, if Jesus, if all Jesus had to do, you know, if Jesus is the son of God and he's the shepherd of souls and he's, he loves you and he wants to save you, if all Jesus had to do was to take a few steps, just a few steps and say, oh no, please wait, let me clarify. If that's, if that's all he had to do to prevent these people from, from leaving him, then I do believe Jesus would have uh, done that, uh, but he didn't uh, because he meant what he said. Uh, and so that's, that's basically why I came to believe in the real presence uh, which is not, as we'll see, uh, the same thing as, as believing in transubstantiation, which is Catholic teaching. We'll, we'll get to that next week. Um, but, but just to accept the idea of, of Jesus meant what he said, and we've got to wrestle with that. And, and so that, that's the heart of the theology of the bread and wine uh, become the body and blood of Christ, which is given in the middle of, of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, but at the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus uh, did something else very interesting. He celebrated, as you know, the, 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 the quote-unquote Last Supper, uh, the, the Lord's Supper, and, it, and it's recorded in three of the four Gospels. Very interestingly, it's not recorded in John's Gospel. There is no account of the Last Supper in, in the fourth Gospel. Uh, rather, what you have is, is uh, uh, the washing of the feet, the pedalavium, uh, as it's called. And, um, which in some ancient Christian communities was practiced, uh, you know, quite like a sacrament. Uh, probably didn't catch on because it's gross. Um, but uh, but you don't you don't have an account of the Last Supper in in John. They they gather in an upper room these disciples, uh, and and paradoxically, uh, or what's paradoxical about it is that is that they're celebrating when they have no earthly reason to do so. Right? There's, it's about to come to a screeching halt. Um, the, the conspirators are afoot, yet um, Jesus throws a party, right? Uh, 
you set a table for me in the wilderness, is the Psalm 23, right? This, Jesus is enacting that. Um, I've given you Matthew's account here in Matthew 26. It says, now they were, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. First things first, uh, I always like what C.S. Lewis said. Uh, C.S. Lewis said once, remember that Jesus said, take, eat, not take, understand. Right? Right off the bat. Please always remember we're dealing with a mystery. <laughs> you know, uh, Take, eat, not take, understand. Um, and again, just remember these basic themes. That, we, that we've heard about first on Sinai. Um, blood is identified with wine, uh, as, it, as in John 6, uh, which now is identified with what? A new covenant. A new covenant. This is, um, this is my blood of the covenant. Again, Exodus 24 should be ringing in your ears. Um, and, and they eat and drink, and, and they see God, as it says in, in in Exodus 24, uh, blood is sprinkled on Israel and new people are made. Uh, here the 12 eat and they drink uh, and they make a new covenant. And again, you think of what it says in John's gospel, even though there's no account of the Last Supper in John's gospel, he describes the evening in detail more than the other three gospels. And, and what, is it, what is said in John's gospel the night before uh, his crucifixion, Philip asks him, show us the Father. And once Jesus said, you've been with me, you've seen the Father, right? And, and, and so you should be thinking of Exodus 24, verse 11, of eating and drinking and what? Seeing God. You've seen the Father, right? Um, uh, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father, he said. And, and so the parallel really couldn't be more striking. Uh, that the, the, the church is made in the new covenant of Jesus' blood, which shows you the Father, right? Th this is... This is Exodus 24 reenacted and perfect. Uh, also notice the verbs. It's always good to fo follow verbs when reading the Bible. Um, these verbs broke, he took, had given thanks, he gave. Um, you, you see these verbs in almost all the accounts of the Last Supper in, in the Gospels. You, you see them also in Luke 24 in the Emmaus story, which we're going to look at in a second. Uh, you find them in... in almost all of the accounts, if not all of the accounts, of the feeding of the multitudes. Um, the, the same verbs of he took, he broke, he gave things. Uh, there's, there's variation uh, from story to story. Uh, you, you see these verbs, as we'll see in, in Paul's writings, uh, and, and you'll even find these verbs, you'll notice them next time you go to Mass. The, 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 those verbs appear in the Eucharistic prayer, which the priest says. Um, in, in his prayer. And so um, these verbs, they signify what Jesus is doing. He, he, he took bread, which some of the mystagogical writers associate with um, the, the incarnation, assuming flesh. Uh, he he uh, blessed it with, with his divinity. Uh, he broke it and he gave it, which, is, which evokes the, the passion, breaking and sacrifice. Um, giving is, is, a, is a cultic sort of verb also. Um, and, 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 and so you think about it uh, with these verbs which, which evoke who God is and what God does, right? Uh, his, his godness, his ability to make a covenant, and also his, his sacrifice. These verbs point to all those things. Um, then, then you come to realize that... Um, except for a very few of them, this Last Supper is as close as they will ever get to Calvary, right? This, the, the Last Supper is as close as, as most of them will get to the sacrifice, which is no different a situation than you and me, right? Um, also, by the way, this is why um, that's there, the crucifix, and it's why you don't see it, I see it, it's a uh, crucifix right here uh, on the altar. It's canon law. Um, 
visible on or near every altar in the Catholic world has to be an image of the crucified, right? Uh, because um, uh, the, 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 the sacrifice of the mass, he took, he broke it and all that stuff, uh, it, it, it theologically in, in its essence evokes the passion and so visually it must evoke the passion as well in, in our ornamentation, which is why um, this used to be over there and uh, the, we had the resurrection, Jesus, beautiful image, but we moved it to the office, right? Uh, because that's more in keeping with the tradition of the church. Um, but, but anyway, so, so the Eucharist draws us close to the passion. Um, also notice very quickly that, that, that this is for the forgiveness of sins, right? Um, the Eucharist is for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, we, and we can talk about that, more of that later, hopefully. Uh, and, and again, that very enigmatic line, I tell you I not drink again the fruit of this vine until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. You know, what, what does that mean? Does it mean the end of time? Or does it mean Easter? <laughs> you know, does it mean the age of the church? Um, finally, moving on, we, we read the Emmaus story from Luke 24. And again, it's a very long passage. We only look at a little bit. These two men uh, listen to this unknown figure talk to them about the scriptures and its fulfillment, and they, and they, they don't realize who this mysterious figure is and, until uh, he, they ask him to dine with him. And, and this is how it ends. It says, that, so they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but he urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward the evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. He was at table with them, and he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it, ding, 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 for the early Christian reader, um, and gave it to them. And what happened? Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, right? Exodus 24, 11, they ate and drank and they saw God. Um, and he vanished from their sight. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us while we talked to him on the road, while they opened the scriptures to us, right? So again, you see those verbs. You should be thinking Exodus 24 by this point. Um, uh, and again, you see in, in Luke 24, uh, the basic pattern of liturgy, the word, and, and liturgy, the sacrament you find in the mass, right? Jesus talks to him about the scriptures and then he eats with them, right? And this is the origin of this twofold structure of our worship uh, when it comes to the Eucharist. So moving on to, to Paul, very swiftly, uh, uh, most of what Paul taught about the Eucharist you find in the Corinthian letters. Um, 1 Corinthians mostly, uh, chapters 10 and 11. Again, uh, just good advice here, I think. <laughs> uh, one of the ways I got my head around the Bible is just by sitting down and reading like the whole of 1 Corinthians in one sitting or reading Acts of the Apostles in one. Read it like, a, like you would a normal book, right? That helps you get the story. When you break it up in these little passages, uh, no wonder it doesn't make sense. Um, so do that with uh, John's Gospel in 1 Corinthians. Uh, so let, let's look at Paul's view of the Eucharist there in 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, and after supper saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined uh, so that we might not be condemned along with the world. And so first things first, very interesting. How on earth could Paul said he received it from the Lord? Uh, he must have received it uh, from the apostles. Uh, yet his, his, his assumption about what tradition is, is such. He can still say, I've got it from the Lord, right? Uh, and, and uh, notice also the verbs, which I pointed out, uh, that Paul uses. And, and then also notice he talks about uh, remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me, that very famous phrase, uh, remembrance. Now, now, the Greek word there is, is anamnesis. 
Um, and and it, when it's used in Scripture, uh, it, it and even outside Scripture in the ancient world, anamnesis, remembrance, do this in remembrance of me. It, it, it means more than just historical recall, right? It, it means more than just uh, remembering. Um, rather, anamnesis means uh, a making of the past present, right? Uh, it, it's, it's like if you read in the Psalms, sometimes the Psalm, psalmist, you know, he'll be in crisis or under attack or something, and, and he'll say, God, remember the covenant. Remember the covenant. He's, when he's praying, rem- you know, he's asking God to remember the covenant. He's not sitting there saying, let's think about that. <laughs> you know, he's, let's recall that event. No, he's saying, act on the covenant now, right? Um, you know, it's kind of like that Randy Travis song, but on the other hand, is a golden band, right? You know, he, he, it's not a song about just remembering your wedding day. It's a song about living your vows, which you made on your wedding day now. Is that going to make sense? That's what we mean by remember. Um, when you do this in remembrance of me, it's more than just memorial. Um, it's also a very interesting pra- fra- phrase about uh, the Eucharist proclaiming the death of the Lord. It represents Calvary. Um, and also knows the, the moral demands of the Eucharist. He says, before you can receive the Eucharist, you must discern the body, right? And that's not an invitation to think about theology. It's, a, it's an invitation to think about ethics. Um, the problem in Corinth was that the Eucharist was celebrated horribly and, and because the, the, the well-to-do and the rich uh, would, would gather together when the people who weren't well-to-do and rich still had to work and they would start the Eucharist without them, right? And then the, everybody else would come on later and um, there was also a potluck associated with probably and, and it was just, it, it, all the rubbish social divisions which we still wrestle with today um, were, were infiltrating the communion, right? And, and, and that's why Paul said, your Eucharist isn't a Eucharist. I'm sorry to inform you. And because and, and he says some pretty harsh things. And, and he tells me, he said, look, you, you have to discern the body, i.e., you have to realize that these people are your brothers and sisters and actually act like it in order for your Eucharist to be legitimate, right? And, and, and so that, that's, that's the great moral power uh, of the Eucharist. And, and Paul adds a warning there, like, if you're not doing that, it's not going to go well for you, right? Some of you have died, he says. Um, and, and so, whew, that, should, that should give you a little pause even today. Um, we continue with Paul uh, here from chapter uh, 10. He says, the cup of blessing we bless. Is it not a participation, a communion, a koinonia in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Remember that concept of the sacrament. It's a sign which participates in what it signifies. Um, because there is one bread, we who are many, uh, uh, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? The food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I want you to be participants. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You, you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now here's the problem is that some of these sophisticated Corinthians uh, were also um, so sophisticated that they, they still like to have an invitation to the pagan sacrifice around the corner, you know? And um, Paul is pointing out to them that they can't do that. Uh, that, that when you share a, a, a meal with someone, you become a companion, companos, which just means with bread, right? You become a bread sharer. And, and that establishes, again, going back to Exodus 24, that establishes that sort of moral, um, cultic, ethical family bond, right? And so Paul is saying, you're a companion with your fellow Christians and with Christ. And so therefore you can't be a companion with pagans, right? And Paul knows what he's talking about. He's talking, he's giving this advice in Corinth, which is a rem- probably the most pluralistic city in the ancient world at the time, 
right? He talks about, and elsewhere in First Corinthians, he goes, he's looking around Corinth, he says, I notice there are many gods and many lords, but you're a Christian, right? That's Paul's answer to pluralism. Uh, you're a Christian. That's wonderful, beautiful city, nice statues. You're a Christian, right? And, and, and Eucharistic life, Eucharistic discipline, uh, uh, you, you know, was, 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 was um, the product of that, faith in, in the one Christ. Um, and again, think of it in, in other terms. Uh, there, there is very much an ethical jealousy which, is, which belongs to the church, uh, which belongs to the faith, right? God was a jealous God for Israel, and, and there, there still is jealousy within, within the church's ethics. Um, and, and it's analogous to, to this, right? So um, you only have sexual relations with your wife or with your husband. And, and when you don't do that, when you do something else, that's bad, right? That's the analogy at work in Paul's mind. Um, because because a, a sacred meal uh, it, it binds the family. Um, and so this is why, for example, non-Christians can't receive communion. Uh, people don't believe in Jesus. Um, and it's also why, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, or here in a second, um, this is also why Protestants can't receive communion in the Roman Catholic Church, right? We'll talk about this. Um, uh, you know, it's, it seems harsh, this, this Catholic teaching, uh, this Roman Catholic teaching, uh, but, but it isn't actually. It's, it's, Catholics are like the last man standing um, uh, because this is what Christians always believed, actually. Um, so, so it seems harsh. You know, why can't Protestants receive communion? Uh, why can't anybody receive communion? Um, uh, I've always thought of it visually. Communion, as, as we've talked about, involves two things, right? It, it involves uh, communion with God in Christ, uh, in, in, in faith, and, and this is personal and beautiful and intimate. And, and let's just say that this is sort of like the vertical aspect of communion, right? And, 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 but you also have at the same time uh, the, the truth that communion involves communion with each other, right? It involves every one of us in what Paul called the obedience uh, of, of faith. And, and this is the communal, the horizontal, or the visible, the, the horizontal aspect, right? And, and so in the Catholic Church's view, and it's the Orthodox view, it's Paul's view, uh, Christian communion, koinonia, right, involves both the, the vertical, that intimate, beautiful, you and Jesus faith, and the horizontal, right? And you can't have, you can't take one away and, and it be the same, right? Um, and, 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 and so the Catholic Church doesn't um, forbid non-Catholics from receiving communion out of spite, right? The Catholic Church is not telling a Methodist or a Baptist or, or an Episcopalian, you know, your relationship with God is somehow faulty or, or bad or, or not true, right? It, the, 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 the vertical is quite beautiful and quite yours, right? Um, what the Catholic Church is saying is we've got a problem with the horizontal, right? Clearly things are broken at the level of visible communion, and we need to be honest about that and work together, pray together, and seek God's will together for, for, to be united in, in, in that truth, right? So uh, an analogy from family life helps me under, understand this. Um, why, uh, well, just put it, think about it this way. So, my, so imagine like my son and I don't know why I think my son would be the one that does this. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm projecting. Um, imagine my son, you know, when he hits 13 or 14, uh, gets so mad at us, you know, he slams his fist on the table, starts cussing, and just storms out of the house, right? See you later. And, and he's gone for days, weeks, years, right? Uh, and, and, and so that means he's not part of our life. That means he's not eating dinner with us, you know? Uh, and, and, and we want him there. But let's say, you know, several years down the road, here comes the boy, now a man, and he just sits down at the table because it's dinner time, 
and he starts helping himself to the mashed potatoes without saying a word, right? That'd be like a super awkward moment. And, and uh, we'd just kind of look at him and, and, and you would viscerally feel the need to talk, you know, uh, before this meal can be a genuine sort of celebration of family life. Well, we need to go have a talk and a cry. We need to go have a reconciliation, right? And fundamentally, that, that is basically the Catholic position when it comes to separated brothers and sisters uh, and, their, and their relationship to the Eucharist. We want them there, but we need to go have that talk and a cry first, right? Uh, because uh, everybody messed up, right? Uh, parents and kids and everything. So uh, we could go more and more on that because I know it's very sensitive for a lot of people. For me, it's always been easy for some strange reason. Um, uh, I, I guess it's because I just began with Paul uh, and I was like, okay, that's how it is. Um, and, and I remember as an Anglican, whenever I'd go to like Roman Catholic places, uh, I w- it always drove me crazy when they tried to give me the communion, right? Because I knew that that's not what their church actually taught, right? And they're trying to be polite, but I'm like, please stay away. Um, because, that, you know, the burden of truth is more converting than uh, nice lies, but that's another matter. Um, th- this is kind of what Paul's saying. If you look at this, that's why I put this passage from 1 Corinthians 5. Um, this is a passage strangely about excommunication. He's talking about why we should excommunicate this person, a certain person. He says, um, uh, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What he's saying is that the ecclesial body, the body of the church made by the Eucharist has to be preserved in, in integrity, right? Um, and so uh, in, in Paul's circumstance, there, there is a, a, you know, people living really scandalous lives of, of sexual immorality and this, that, and the other. Um, and Paul is saying they, they need to be excommunicated for the sake of preserving the body, right? Uh, now, I, I should have said, uh, when the Catholic Church is talking about why non-Catholics can't receive communion, the Catholic Church is not talking about the, the, the moral state of Baptists, right? Um, and in fact, we could probably learn a few things from the Baptists uh, when it comes to morality. Um, but, but, but you see sort of the basic Pauline point. So moving on to Hebrews real quick, uh, and uh, then we'll uh, stop at the book of Revelation. Um, in, in the letter of the Hebrews, which is a beautiful text, uh, again, one of those things you can just read forever, uh, we, Jesus is described as the high priest uh, in, in very Jewish cultic terms. And so this passage from Hebrews 9, he says, but when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of uh, defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Um, the background here, as I said, is, is, is the Jewish priesthood. Uh, the, the high priest who would enter once a year into the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem and, and make an offering for the sins of the people, sprinkling, um, you know, blood on the, on the mercy seat. Uh, it's very simple. What, what the writer of the Hebrews is saying is that now Jesus is the high priest and he's not using the blood of animals, he's using his own blood. And since his own blood is both innocent and divine, it just works better. <laughs> it works better than animal blood. And, 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 uh, so much better, it works perfectly, you know. Um, and, and, and so, in, you know, you get this imagery elsewhere in, in Matthew's gospel. <clears throat> For example, you know, the temple veil is torn in two at the crucifixion, uh, you know, evoking the idea that, that Christ's priesthood allows us to enter into the holy, holy, holy of holies, uh, into the heavenly holy of holies. Um, 
Also, also notice, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting, um, uh, he, he speaks in the, in the present tense, but anyway, that's, a, that's an aside. Um, Hebrews 10 uh, compares Jesus, the high priest, with other high priests, and again, the, the teaching is much the same. He says, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after, uh, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds... I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Again, the Eucharist for forgiveness. Uh, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near uh, with a true heart and the full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, right? This, this, this shows how Jesus' blood uh, is, is perfect and, and he only had to enter the Holy of Holies once, right? Uh, as opposed to year after year. Uh, and and a, as an aside, this is a great point. This is the great point that, that many of the Protestant reformers made, um, that Christ is sacrificed once, right? Uh, and of course, the Protestant reformers were were right. Uh, there was great confusion leading up to the Reformation and beyond it. Uh, that was basically terminological and and cultural. Um, the Church, the Catholic Church, never, ever, 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 ever taught uh, that Christ was re-sacrificed uh, numer numerically. Right? That the um, uh, his, his sacrifice is re-presented in the Mass. He's not re-sacrificed. Um, but of course, at the time of the Reformation, this was in some instances not very clear at all. Um, when you have uh, uh, you know, a runaway problem with indulgences and chantry masses and, and all that stuff, you, you see what the Protestant reformers were on about. Um, but again, to step back, just to notice these basic themes of flesh and blood, faith and forgiveness, um, uh, baptism and Eucharist, all of it's merged with this idea that Jesus is the high priest, right? Again, the fulfillment of, of, of Jewish cultic hope and practice, right? Uh, and it's active uh, today. Again, you know, the present tense. Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a phrase that's often sort of removed and put on T-shirts. Uh, but, but, but that phrase, the context of it is Eucharist. You know, the context of it is, is high priesthood. Um, and again, it's... A, it's We'll skip that uh, phrase from Hebrews 12. Um, it just talks about the justice of the, the blood of God. Uh, and so to finish, I just want to finish by pointing to the book of Revelation, uh, John's revelation, uh, the revelation to John, it, it, to speak technically. Um, and, and it happened on the Lord's Day. It happened on Sunday uh, while I was at Mass on Patmos. Uh, and so just reading this passage, these two passages from Revelation 7, uh, just notice the similarities with Exodus and, and the Gospels. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one can number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels are standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might uh, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Um, so, so the Passover symbolism, right? Um, that's, that's the lamb. The lamb evokes the Passover. Uh, but it also evokes what John the Baptist said of Jesus. Uh, that he is the Lamb of God, right? And the Lamb of God, the Lamb, is a sacrificial Lamb, which points you to, to the Eucharist, right? 
Um, John continues in Revelation 7, he says, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb is in the midst of the throne. Uh, the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Um, and so just to stop and think, you know, those who are in heaven uh, have been washed, what? In the blood of the lamb. Right, this beautiful sort of mixing of an image, uh, being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Washing points to baptism, blood points to Eucharist, in the Lamb, Jesus, right? Baptism, Eucharist, you, that's how you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, right? So baptism and Eucharist are evoked. These robes are white because they're innocent, that is, they're forgiven, which we saw in the Last Supper. Uh, the Lamb will shelter them with his presence, and again, you should think of Exodus 24, you should think of uh, Jesus' words, abide in me, remain, right? All of this is blended together in this beautiful apocalyptic imagery. Um, uh, and also, I just think of early Christianity, uh, and even today, you know, catechumens are baptized in white. Um, uh, so it's an image of, uh, of the adoration of the Lamb, uh, which is a Eucharistic symbol, right? And again, think of the Catholic Mass. What, what, do, what does the priest say? When he, at the end, you know, he says, behold what the Lamb of God, right? And so, and so uh, the, the, the Eucharist is, is, takes all, I mean, John's revelation takes all of this stuff and sort of puts it in this beautiful, amazing sort of visual, uh, which is really nothing more than a meditation on the Mass itself. Uh, the Eucharist is also in, in the book of Revelation very beautifully merged with the imagery of, of marriage, uh, blending the themes of Passover, you know, lamb and sacrifice, with the, the, the great nuptial analogy um, that you find in Scripture, the idea that God and Israel are married, and that, that, that God, Christ and the church are, are wedded. Um, and so you see this in Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deed of the, deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God, right? So as I said, you get this Exodus Lamb theme now it's blended with this marriage supper theme. Um, and so, so the Eucharist sort of finds itself in, in, in heaven. Um, and, 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 you know, that again, we see this stuff in, in the celebration of the Mass. We, we begin the Eucharistic prayer singing what? Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, right? We're entering into the heavenly. And it ends with behold the Lamb of God, right? Um, and so... You know, with those illusions, with those, with those connections, um, you know, the, the, the point is, is that when an early Christian would have heard or read these scriptures, they would have immediately thought of what they do on a Sunday. They would have immediately thought of what they do in worship with bread and wine, right? Um, which, one last aside, I've, I use this in homilies from time to time. It's a, I stole it from a mentor. Um, you know, if, if, a Chris, if, you, if somehow you could teleport a Christian from the first century to Dallas, Texas in 2021, and you took them on a tour of churches, and you took them to, you know, this church down the road, uh, that had a, a, you know a band and drums and big screens and and everybody's waving their hands and having a good time, good preaching even. If you were to take this teleported first century Christian there, it wouldn't dawn on them that they're in a Christian church. 
it wouldn't immediately strike them that they're in a Christian church attending Christian worship. Devil worshipers did this too, you know. That, that wouldn't dawn on them. But if you brought them here, the second they saw bread and wine on the table, they'd know they're in a Christian church. They would know they're among Christians. See what I'm saying? That, that's, that's how central it was uh, for biblical Christians. So for, very finally, at the end, um, uh, these themes of Exodus and the Lamb and the marriage and the supper, they, they, these, these themes, as I said, you know, Paschal Lamb, sacrifice, marriage supper, baptism, Eucharist, all of it comes to rest in the, in the larger story uh, of the restoration of Eden, the healing and the recapitulation of all things, right? So you get this very beautiful thing at the end of Revelation. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb of God in the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his ser servants will worship him. They will see his face, Exodus 24. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light or of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So think about this, the Bible ends uh, with the image of, of a city with a river running through it. Um, and it's lined with trees that give healing, its leaves give healing. The Bible begins with the tragedy of Eden, uh, but it ends with the city of God, right? And, and, and the way you get into this city is, 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 is through the flesh of the Lamb, right? Eden's curse, which began with eating, is, is, is reversed, right, by eating. And so this is just a brief sketch of, of, of what we Catholics are on about when we talk about the Eucharist being the source and the summit of things. Um, uh, be, because Eden is, is reprised, so to speak, in, in baptism and, and, and Eucharist. And, and so the, the, the basic point is if you want to get back to Eden, uh, uh, that's how you do it. You, you, you participate in the new covenant of the body and blood of this Lamb of God, this Jesus, right? And so that's the Eucharist in the Bible. Uh, and, and next time we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how the early church took this idea um, and... and, and and basically revolutionized the world with it. So thank you all very much, and thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank you.